Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Avia Haynes, Director of Marketing and Communications for NTCA. I hope everybody is staying healthy and safe. Today's webinar is titled In-Floor Radiant Heating. In this webinar, we'll focus on types of in-floor heating and the features and benefits of each, installation of uncoupling membrane heat systems, and the key parts of installation to ensure safety and success. Today's sponsor is Ardex. Please look for their advertisement in Tile Letter Magazine and multiple NTCA digital formats. Before we continue, I have a few things to mention. Today's webinar will be muted. If you have any questions, please use the questions area on your computer. We will answer them at the end of this presentation. All of our webinars are available to watch on our YouTube channel. If you go to the NTCA YouTube channel and subscribe, you'll be notified of our upcoming NTCA videos, including our webinars, giving you easier access to watch all current and past programs at your convenience. If the audio on your computer is poor, call the number provided on the webinar invite and listen on your phone. Today's speaker is Thomas Utley, Technical Specialist for Artex Tile Stone, Tile and Stone Installation Systems. Thomas's area of specialty includes Artex Flexphone Uncoupling, Flexphone Heat, and Acoustic Sound Deafening Systems. Welcome, Thomas. Thank you. And you can start when you're ready. <clears throat> okay, welcome everybody, and thank you for attending today's webinar on in-floor radiant heating. Um, presentation should take between 30 and 40 minutes, and then we can open it up for questions uh, at the end. I guess you'll be typing the questions along the way. <clears throat> so the thing about today's uh, in-floor radiant heating, um, when you're using the mats, um, it's basically like a four-in-one heating system. You have more than just the radiant heat. You have the membrane that also has the uncoupling technology, waterproofing, and also a degree of soundproofing. So with the uncoupling technology, that's going to, of course, protect the tile and the grout joints from shear movement from the substrate. The waterproofing, uh, depending on the manufacturer that you use, um, these systems can be used in wet areas such as uh, bathrooms, laundry rooms, or other wet areas such as bars. As far as the sound attenuation, um, these mats do have a degree of impact sound attenuation with the Delta IC probably anywhere between 8 and 20, um, which definitely helps. So, these mats are ideal for large format tile and stone installations. And a lot of these manufacturers today, they offer a single source solution where they provide the mats, the wires, the mortars, adhesives, grouts, everything you need to complete the entire system. And they also offer comprehensive wraparound warranties as well. With these in-floor radiant heated systems, um, most manufacturers out there will offer three thermostat options and a power module option, which is commonly referred to as a relay. You have a standard non-programmable thermostat, as you can see in the upper right-hand corner, and the lower left corner, just a standard touch programmable thermostat, or your best option, is in the top left has the wi-fi capabilities so you can monitor your energy usage um, not just from your home computer but also from your smartphone and then the power module uh, again referred to as a relay in the bottom right corner um, we'll cover that a little bit later but that's commonly used when you have a series of cables across a floor um, at a lower price point with a thermostat telling all the relays what temperature to make the rest of that floor. With these radiant heated systems, uh, commonly you're going to see 120 volt and 240 volt systems. Some manufacturers also offer a 208 volt option 
Um, that seems to be more commonly seen in Canada and on the West Coast. So with a 120 volt system, I commonly get asked, why, why would I use a 120 volt system versus a 240 volt system? Well, general consensus is, as far as uh, energy consumption, when you start getting up around 100, 120 square foot, it kind of makes sense to jump to a 240 volt option um, because it doesn't pull as much energy. It's, ju it's just more efficient to run that way. It's common like if you have a thousand square foot house and you try to put a little teeny uh, thousand uh, watt air conditioner in a window, it's gonna work like crazy and it's just gonna draw a lot of energy. It's not really designed for that. So I get commonly asked that question. So I thought I'd share that. Okay, so with these radiant heating systems, um, they're approved for a lot of different types of uh, flooring. Um, approved wood, approved luxury vinyl tile and plank, approved carpet, and of course, ceramic and porcelain tile. And the reason that I say approved wood, LVT and carpet, you always want to check with that particular flooring manufacturer for their recommendations on in-floor radiant heat. And they'll actually have specifications about how hot you can run that radiant heat under their flooring um, without um, resulting in complications. So the majority of these in-floor radiant heated systems, um, they're designed for indoor use only over concrete, wood screeds, properly prepared gypsum or cement backer board units. Yeah, they're, these systems are commonly seen in residential applications, multifamily housing, but also in commercial offices, restaurants, and retail stores. As you can see here with your radiant heat, uh, many manufacturers offer an array of spacing with their cables. Um, generally anywhere from three inches up to around five inches in width spacing of these cables. Um, the narrow spacing is, is commonly referred to as primary heating, where the other spacings are referred to as uh, comfort heat. Um, your wattage is going to vary depending on your spacing. Um, manufacturers generally, these burn maybe um, between 10 watts and up to 13 watts per square foot. <clears throat> So when you install these mats, either to put them down to the substrate <clears throat> or to place your tile and floorings on top, <clears throat> it's important to use the specified mortar. So as you can see, we have a series of mortars here um, rated per the ANSI A118 standards. Um, some manufacturers may require that you use ANSI 118.1 which is a standard unmodified dry set cement mortar. Most manufacturers will recommend the ANSI A118.4, which is a modified uh, dry set mortar. So in certain cases, when you need to put these um, products down over top of plywood, that's where you're going to jump to the ANSI A118.11 um, for bonding to that plywood substrate. And of course, if you want to go with the improved modified uh, dry cement mortar, that would be the ANSI A118.15, which has much more stringent standards for uh, shear. Um, so, and these manufacturers may even offer a longer warranty depending on the mortar that you use. So, one of the most important thing with these rated heating systems is you need to make sure you have a proper floor plan beforehand. Um, as you can see from the diagram, you have a floor, so you're gonna order a square footage of mat um, that's gonna take up more space than, than the square footage of cable that you're gonna put into the mat because um, you don't run these cables under cabinets or through walls and so forth, which we're gonna cover here in, uh, in a couple more slides. and most manufacturers do require you to diagram that on their warranty sheets and send that in along with the products that you have used. So some of the constraints that you're going to see with these radiant heated systems, 
Um, commonly, you never want to install these electrical heating cables underneath the vanities, bathtub platforms, bathtubs, kitchen cabinets, counters, fixtures, or in closets. Because what happens is excessive heat is going to build up in those confined spaces and it may cause the cable to overheat. Um, you could have nuisance tripping. So again, because of that, there's going to be a difference in the amount of heating cable square footage that you or, or versus the amount of membrane that you're going to install um, in, in the room. So always ensure that the areas where you are going to place furniture down, just make sure that there's no heating covers, cables underneath of that furniture unless they have mounting legs that allows that floor to breathe and that heat to escape. So you never want to run these heating cables underneath of a wall or from room to room. Um, that's really important. Um, you don't want too much heat to build up when your cable is running under the wall in different rooms, um, heat and cool differently. Um, it could be problematic. <clears throat> So of course, with basically all flooring, um, whether it be tile or resilient flooring, for your substrate prepa uh, preparation, you want to avoid uh, acid etching, any kind of solvents, adhesive removers, and sweeping con compounds that are going to add contaminants to the substrate. Anything that you're going to use to push those contaminants down further into the substrate, which will leach out later and could be a bond failure. Um, most of these manufacturers are going to recommend that your substrate temperature be a minimum of 50 degrees Fahrenheit for installation of the products. Um, and they say that they want that for 24 hours before, during, and after the installation. All your substrates should be load-bearing, load flat, and structurally sound. And they should be smooth and flat with a maximum variance of quarter inch and 10 feet from the required plane. And this is per the TCNA and TTMAC guidelines, or as recommended by the tile and stone manufacturer, make sure you're defaulting to the most stringent requirement. Make sure to level the floor prior to the installation of your heat cables or your heat mat. Mortar and level or thickness greater than a quarter inch over these uncoupling mats. General consensus is it kind of interferes with the uncoupling capability of the mat. So for your wood substrates, your wood flub subfloor should be constructed according to the prevailing building codes. It should always be solid and securely fixed, have a nice good rigid base and free from flex. And for tile insulations, uh, your subfloor should be constructed in accordance with either the L over 360 or the L over 720 standards, depending on uh, your tile size, of course, and the type of tile. Uh, the surface of the wood should always, of course, be free of oil, grease, wax, and shellacs, any kind of contaminant that can act as a bomb breaker. Um, commercial drum sanders are good to sand down these floors. Um, never, again, use solvents, strippers, or cleaners, anything that's going to act as a, a bomb breaker. Um, generally, with the joints, uh, they, should be, they should be filled with an approved patching compound, one that can be sanded down as well. So most of these rec uh, recommendations, most of your manufacturers are going to have the same recommendations here uh, to use an exterior grade plywood or OSB um, that's either five eighths inches or three quarter inch tongue and groove and make sure you're faster than the plywood or the OSB every six inches along the sheets and eight inches along the supports with ring shaped nails or screws and allow that eighth inch between sheets. The underlayment must be constructed of 3 8 plug face exterior grade plywood and fasten every six inches. Allow eighth inch between the sheets and a quarter inch on the ends and at perimeter walls. So for your ceramic and porcelain tile installations, if a single layer of plywood or OSB is going to be used, uh, joy spacing is 16 inch or 19 inch on center is required. 
For 16 inch joist spacing, the minimum sub floor thickness must be 5 8 inch tongue and groove wood. Again, these are standard recommendations by the majority of your manufacturers. For 19 inch joist spacing, the minimal sub floor thickness needs to be 3 quarter inch tongue and groove. And for 24 inch joist spacing, you have to double layer your plywood or OSB as required. The minimum subfloor thickness must be three quarter inch tongue and groove and a minimum underlayment nominal thickness of three eighths inch. For natural stone installations, uh, two layers of plywood or OSB are always required regardless of your joist spacing. And this is for the TCNA or TTMAC guidelines. However, the joist spacing must not exceed 24 inches on center and the double layer wood flooring must have a minimum subfloor thickness of three quarter inch. All existing expansion joints, isolation joints, as well as moving cracks need to be honored up the whole way through the system, including the uncoupling membrane and the tile. And this is indicated by the TCNA and TTMAC guidelines. Um, the joints also need to be honored up through the heating cables. You don't want to take these heating cables and try to um, go over top of expansion joints. Um, that will be problematic. Perimeter and field movement joints are essential for door areas, thresholds between rooms, geometric offsets, as well as around walls and penetrations of other fixed objects. Commonly, you're going to see Ed's insulation strips um, around the perimeters of the walls. Um, some manufacturers may call those perimeter isolation strips. Um, it's just designed to keep everything off the wall about a quarter inch or six millimeters. <clears throat> Any of your <clears throat> um, saw joints, those can be filled in um, with an approved cementitious patch as directed by that flooring manufacturer. So when you put these membranes down, um, you may find a manufacturer or two out there that recommends an adhesive. Most of your manufacturers are going to uh, recommend a mortar to put these down. And most manufacturers are going to recommend a quarter by quarter inch square notch trowel or maybe a um, um, quarter by three sixteenths V notch uh, to put down their mat. Um, most of the mortar manufacturers, they have a ratio of water to cement that they mix. Um, they'll offer a high and low water ratio. Make sure you check with that particular manufacturer, but most of them are going to suggest that you mix that mortar to the high water ratio. Um, most of these membranes have a fleece backing and it helps to get a better mechanical bond to their products. So when you place these membranes into your mortar beds, there's uh, different techniques you can use. Some people like to use um, a wood float to push your mat down um, to get good uh, transfer to the backside of these mats. Um, other people like to use a 35 to 75 pound three sectional flooring roller to do it. It's just like when you're laying tile, every now and then it's important to lift the corner of the membrane just to make sure you're getting proper transfer uh, to the back of that membrane. Uh, again, leave approximately a quarter inch or six millimeters between the membranes and the edge of the wall. You're going to want that uh, with your tile as well. So with these membranes, when you have structural true expansion joints, Again, we say you need to honor those joints the whole way up through. So you need to leave a gap in these membranes to honor those joints. And you need to cover those joints with a tape when you're applying your mortar, just to ensure that the mortar does not get down in there and try to lock that uncoupling membrane in place. Um, it's common to use a 3 8 gap on each side um, of that membrane to honor that joint. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned earlier about waterproofing applications with these systems. 
depending on the manufacturer, they may require you to use a waterproof mesh tape over top of that seam when you're installing uh, the actual cables. So just refer to their particular guidelines on those situations. When you apply these mortars and get the membrane into it, just make sure you allow them to cure in accordance with the selected mortar technical data um, before installing the cables. And I wanna point out, your flooring contractors are ones that are gonna install these cables into the mats, or if not using the mat, uh, just in the strips on the floor. But it's important that you have a qualified electrician to hook up all your connections to your thermostats and your panel boxes according to all electrical and ethical building codes in your particular reason, regions. So as you can see by the diagram down below, um, any of your zones that are unheated, it's important to go ahead and map those out, not just on your drawing that you submit for warranty purposes, but also take a tape, maybe a blue painter's tape, put it down and map out where your cabinets and everything are going. It's just gonna make it much easier when you snap these cables into those areas. Keep in mind, and we'll cover this in a few slides coming up, you have certain distance that you have to keep these cables away from um, objects such as uh, cabinets, um, islands, um, heating systems, things of that nature. So when you're installing uh, the radiant heated systems, this is one of the things that, that, that may tend to scare people, but it's, it's, it's easy because these manufacturers have good videos on their websites that, that talk about these tests. There's basically three different tests uh, for these radiant heated systems. The first one is the conductor resistance test, and that uses a multimeter to resist, uh, to check the resistance of the wire which is measured in ohms, that's going to be the most common test. Most manufacturers are going to require that test. Um, most manufacturers are only going to require that test, but there are some manufacturers that will require these other two says, tests, such as this conductor and ground braid continuity, where the cable is protected by a ground braid um, and the electrical insulator prevents any contact between the braid and the other two conductors. To make sure there's no contact between the braid and the other conductors, you must perform this continuity test. You also have what's called an insulation resistance test, and it's meant to detect very small breaks throughout the cable insulation. Um, these breaks out often remain undetected during the continuity test since they're not necessarily short circuits. Uh, between the conductor and the ground break, but even the small breaks can cause current leakage to the ground. So your conductor and ground continuity test, the heating cable is again protected by that ground braid, an electrical insulator prevents any contact between that braid and those two conductors to make sure there's no contract between that braid and the two conductors, you must perform this test. You're going to use the continuity test. It's on your multimeter on the bottom, your buzzer logo. It's normally in the bottom, very bottom or bottom right of your multimeter. And you're going to test your cable between the braid and one of the two power leads. If there is no continuity, the test is going to be, it's considered successful. The multimeter is going to um, display, depending on the meter that you use, either an OL for overload or I for infinity. Otherwise, if that test fails, neither the OL or the I will be displayed in the warning tone or buzzer is what you will hear. So the installation resistance test, this test is meant to detect, as I mentioned, very small breaks throughout the cable installation. The brakes often remain undetected during the continuity test since they're not necessarily short circuits. Even small brakes, as I mentioned, can cause current leakage to the ground. Um, this is usually detected by the mandatory ground fault circuit interrupter, um, which is required for these systems. Um, 
the thermostats either have GFCIs built into them or you must use a ground fault circuit interrupter circuit breaker. In order to perform the insulation resistance test, you need to use a, a, a megameter. It's commonly known as a mega um, to take an insulation measurement between the braid and one of those two power leads. You just want to make sure your mega meter is set to the range at 1,000 volts. The insulation resistance measurement must be equal to or greater than one giga ohm. Those manufacturers that require this test, that's what they're going to mandate. Um, but it's very important to read through their nomenclature to make sure that you're in compliance so you meet their warranty requirements. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this test. This is the conductor resistance test, commonly known as the Ohm's resistance test. It's the most common. Um, these heating cables, each of these cables come with a sticker that's going to be uh, similar to what you see here on the screen. Um, these stickers contain the voltage of your cables. Um, some have the, the lineal foot. Um, they'll have it in meters. And if you see the red arrow here, uh, there's a resistance number. This particular label and cable has 8.92 ohms. That number is going to be different for every spool of heating cable wire that you install on your floor. Even if you have, say you have 10 different cables that are the same lineal feet that you install in different rooms, that ohms resistance, uh, the majority of time is going to be slightly different on each cable. So check with your manufacturer. Most manufacturers say that when you measure your ohms on that cable, it needs to fall somewhere in the vicinity of 10% above that number or 5 to 10% below that number. If it falls outside of those guidelines, that means your cable can't be used successfully. So this particular ohms resistance test, it's normally required three times throughout throughout the installation process. When you do this test, at the very bottom of your meter, you'll see a little omega symbol. Those are your settings where you set your ohms. So they're generally 200 and then it jumps to 2000. So if your ohms resistance on your label is anywhere under 200, you're gonna set your dial on your meter to 200. If your cables are over 200 ohm resistance value, you're going to jump that dial up to 2000. That's going to be a little different depending on the meter that you use. If you just have a, a standard uh, digital fault time meter, you may not have to adjust that dial. So if the ohms reading taken on the two power leads does vary, which 10% above, normally 5% below. What that means is the cable has been damaged somewhere in the process, or you just haven't set that dial correctly, as I mentioned earlier, between like 200 and 2000, or the meter is just simply out of calibration. But it's important to do that test three times throughout these installations, because um, you, can, you can damage these cables at any time. So you always want to check it first when you pull the cable out of the box, you want to check it again once you have all your cables installed in the flooring. And after you've installed all your finished flooring, you're going to install it that third time. And most of these manufacturers are also going to require that you have a licensed electrician come in and check that cable one last time before sending in your uh, warranty paperwork. <clears throat> Keep in mind, as I mentioned, some manufacturers will only require that one test other manufacturers may require all three. So the other test that I wanted to mention, this has to do with your temperature sensor cable. These are small, little small black cables. Um, most of these manufacturers are going to provide two of these sensors for your system. They generally put one cable in with a thermostat and a second cable in with a spool of wire. And this is one of the questions that we get often is, 
why are we installing two cables? Well, you install two cables, but you only actually hook one cable up. This will probably on these systems be the first thing that may go over time, years and years down the road. And of course, you don't want to rip up all your flooring. You want to be able to unhook that temperature sensor and hook up your backup. So testing these sensors is easy. Um, you just set your multimeter for resistance at 10K ohms. And these manufacturers will provide a chart depending on the temperature of the room and provide a column for numbers where that resistance value must fall within. So what you're seeing here in this picture is a hot and cold lead. These heating cables are fully energized, but there will be a section generally like the last eight to 12 lineal feet, which is considered a cold lead. As you can see the designation of the blue arrow and to the right, the red arrow, that's the part of the cable that actually heats up. So as you can see, the cable snaps right into this particular mat. Some manufacturers will offer a cable that snaps right into the mat. You're gonna see some manufacturers that actually have a large socket between their hot and their cold lead. If that's the case, you just simply notch out their mat and you set that socket down into the mat and they'll probably generally recommend that you use a hot glue gun to secure that in place. So we talked a little bit about placement of these heating cables, the importance of mapping out where your cabinets and everything um, are gonna be placed. Some manufacturers, um, require a minimum space or, or of two inches from the walls and cabinets. Most manufacturers are gonna be more than that, four to six inches, but they a lot of times they recommend a six inch buffer zone the whole way around the room. And reasoning for that is if you ever have a situation where you end up with too much cable, you have a little buffer zone where you can run that extra cable later because the one thing you never want to do with these radiant heated cables is cut them. If you cut that cable, you change your ohms resistance value, rendering your system useless. So you do not in any circumstance want to cut that cable with one exception. I mentioned that hot cold lead, the cold lead that runs up to your thermostat, that section of the cable can be cut Manufacturers are generally going to say you can never make that cold lead shorter than three lineal feet. Again, make sure you're checking with the manufacturer so you maintain their warranty requirements. When you are placing these heating cables down, um, you need to make sure that you're keeping them eight inches from other heat sources such as fireplaces or uh, register heat vents um, in the floor or in the wall. Make sure you're keeping them four inches from your plumbing drains and especially seven inches from the center line of your toilet drain so you're not heating up your wax ring on your toilet. The sensor cables, uh, remember I mentioned you're only seeing one here, but you're going to install both of those sensor cables into your mats. Um, again, only one of them is going to be hooked up to your thermostat at a time. So a lot of times these cables will snap right into your mats, but the manufacturers generally recommend that you secure these with a hot glue gun as well, um, because there's different methods of setting your tile, which we're going to cover here shortly. Um, but if you do use like a self-leveling uh, cementitious layer, you don't want that wire floating up to the surface. <clears throat> these little black sensor wires, you want to make sure that you follow the channels between the wire. You never want to run those up and over any of your heated wires. And at the end of your wire is the actual sensor. It's important to place that centered between your two heating wires. Again, this is the test two I mentioned. You should do this uh, own resistance test three times throughout the installation. 
Um, the manufacturers are going to require you to record those values on the warranty sheets and send them in for warranty purposes. As mentioned earlier, some of these mats are completely waterproof. Uh, with the exception of the seams, check with the manufacturer. They're probably going to recommend that you use a waterproofing tape um, similar to a geotextile fabric over those seams, followed um, you know, into a small mortar bed and then mortar over top before laying your tile. So once all the cables have been installed and you do your second resistance test, you're going to pre-fill the membrane uh, using an ANSI A118 approved mortar. Remember, I said either an A118 1, 4, 11, or 15. You can also, as you can see from the bottom picture on the right, uh, use a self-leveling underlayment, which is quicker and easier. However, you have to wait till the following day to set your tile, um, normally to let that leveler dry and cure out. Whereas if you're using a mortar to pre-fill these mats, you can put the mortar in it and go wet on wet and install your tile right away. So you're gonna go ahead, if, if you're using mortar and you're doing the wet on wet, pre-fill the membrane and use a correct notch size trowel, depending on the size of the uh, stone um, or ceramic that you're laying. Just make sure you're following the TCNA or TTMAC guidelines um, for that trowel size. And again, periodically lift the tile to check and make sure you're getting proper uh, transfer to the back of your tile. Again, once you're completely done with your installation of your tile, you're going to do that last cable resistance test. <clears throat> and then you're going to allow your tile and your grout insulation to occur prior to turning on uh, your heat. So make sure that you follow these rating heat manufacturer's requirements. Some of them are going to tell you it's okay as soon as seven days is up that you can energize your floor and, get, and start running it. Others are going to tell you you're going to need to wait 28 to 30 days. Just make sure you follow their guidelines to make sure that you stay in compliance. So after your installation is complete, along with any other type of flooring installation, make sure you're avoiding foot traffic. Um, during the installation, once the mortar has cured, if you have to uh, protect it uh, with um, you know, plywood, things of that nature. Now, due to the properties of these membranes, uh, the mortar types, the size of the tiles, climatic conditions, you're gonna have to wait a different amount of time. Most mortars um, that are used with these membranes, they typically are gonna per, uh, permit you to grout within a range of three to 24 hours. Just make sure you're following those manufacturers required timelines, again, before energizing that floor. So I mentioned about your different joints earlier. Um, for your soft joints, just make sure um, that you're using an ASTM C920 approved um, sealant. That's a non-hardening elastomeric joint sealant uh, for tile and stone applications. And uh, your ASTM C921 will actually give you guidelines on, on how you actually install that. Um, so we covered a lot today with these radiant heated systems. Um, so what we're going to do at this time is we're going to open it up to questions, the questions that anybody may have typed throughout the presentation. Avia? Hi, yes, thank you very much. Um, I, we do have one question. The question is, why not under a freestanding tub? You can under uh, a freestanding tub as long as it has feet. You, you need to make sure that there's an ample amount of airspace underneath so that cable does not heat up under that tub and cause nuisance tripping of your uh, ground fault circuit interrupter. Okay, well, that was our only question, but it, I'm sure other people will have questions. And if you do, 
please, if you think of one afterwards, please email Jim and um, he's at jim at tile-assn.com. Well, thank you again. And um, for everyone out there, please register for our next webinar. It's scheduled for November 24th and the invites will be sent out soon. Thank you again, Thomas. We really appreciate it. Oh, wait, yep. hold on. Someone's just dropped in a question if you have time real quick. <laughs> Um, they're asking about the use of baccarats. You said that you didn't mention it. Baccarat. Yes, so for an existing expansion joint that's in the substrate um, that you have to fill with elastomeric sealant, um, you can use a baccarat first to take up uh, a lot of that space and then fill the top with the sealant, absolutely. Okay. Oh, now they're coming in. And just says, I think he's talking about what you just asked. Okay, and then um, for those who are asking about the replay, yes, it will be on YouTube. All right, I think now that's it. Well, thank you again. And I um, wish everybody a good day. Thank you, Avia. Thanks.